Okay. Um, again, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Adlan Fela. I'm senior analyst with Maravedis LLC, boutique wires infrastructure analyst firm based here in Miami, Florida. Um, I'm very pleased and, and proud to present today's uh, event, uh, which has been the result of a lot of work uh, uh, with great partners, great speakers, and great sponsors. Um, this webinar has been made possible by all of the company names you see on the slide here. And we also wanna thank uh, our media partners, Informatech, TMN, Rethink Research for helping us promote the event. And many of you have uh, uh, registered for the event today. So we're very happy, we're very pleased. Uh, some housekeeping items here, like most events online, this event is being recorded. And all the material will be sent to you in the next 24 hours, including the slide deck. This is a long webinar today. We have about two hours with a break at the end of the first hour. A two minute break just to give you a chance to have a glass of water and take a big breath after so much content. Uh, the question format will be different this time. Uh, I will be asking each presenter a question at the end of their presentations. But we encourage you uh, to uh, submit your questions as we go, as these will be reviewed and answered after the event. I also encourage you to download this white paper we produced on behalf of Ambient uh, on the impact of COVID-19 on hub Wi-Fi networks and the need for a spectrum broker. You can use the link here to download this set of white paper. So what really drove us to organize this event? I mean, we really felt that there were two, uh, sorry, three major forces driving Wi-Fi right now. Even as stay-at-home restrictions are being eased in many countries, one in three humans is still confined at home due to COVID-19. And the internet is being used at scales never seen before. Fast and reliable broadband and Wi-Fi have become the lifeline to millions for work, education, socialization, and entertainment. And I'm sure including for this particular, this very same webinar, many of you are watching from home. At the same time, uh, the uh, US regulator, the FCC, has made the historic decision to open up 60 GHz spectrum for licensed bands, mainly Wi-Fi. This is opening new possibilities to take advantage of the capabilities of Wi-Fi 6 in 1.2 gigahertz of new spectrum. And we believe and, uh, that Europe will follow suit in the next 12 to 18 months. So there will be also implications for European operators and consumers. All of these developments are really taking place as Wi-Fi 6 technology and Wi-Fi 6E is being introduced and entering the marketplace, bringing a new set of capabilities and use cases. To discuss all of this, we have a very dense and rich program today. We apologize for uh, having included giant gender diversity in, in, into today's programs, uh, but we hope that uh, we're offsetting that by bringing you a set of speakers from the different parts of the ecosystem. During the first hour, I will hear the latest updates on certification and innovation from Kevin Robinson at Wi-Fi Alliance, then learn about the impact of stay-at-home orders on home Wi-Fi networks from Nicola Fortino at Liberty Global International. Uh, Tyler Gregg from Minim We'll then discuss the hub edge security issues as people work from home. To close the first hour, Alan Coleman from Sweeper will present innovative ways for service providers to improve customer experience in light of so much demand on home broadband. After the first hour, we'll give you guys a chance to have a two minute break to take a glass of water and take a deep breath. During the second hour, we we'll resume with Stefan de Beul at Comscop, who will go over some of the new use cases enabled by Wi-Fi 6. Then Carlos Gandarias will then share the vision and strategy of Telefonica for the connected home and Wi-Fi in particular. Then Mustafa Ergen from Startup Ambient will present a novel approach to manage interference and improve quality of experience. Last but not least, uh, Chris Silderberg from Informatech 
will share with us what to expect at the Broadband World Forum 2020, one of the largest broadband events in the world. So without further ado, I'll leave the stage to Kevin Robinson. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Adeline. Hopefully everyone was able uh, to see my screen. Um, again, thanks for the opportunity to be, to be here. Uh, this is an incredibly exciting time for Wi-Fi with some of the recent developments uh, happening in the regulatory space. Uh, so for those who may not be familiar, Wi-Fi Alliance is a worldwide network of companies that brings you Wi-Fi. Uh, we're really made up of kind of the who's who in the technology space. And we've been instrumental in driving the success of Wi-Fi and making it as prevalent as it is over the past 20 years. One of the most important things we do is we administer a program called Wi-Fi Certified that ensures that end users get the best possible experience from their Wi-Fi devices. And it's in no small part to this program that we have approaching 13 billion Wi-Fi devices still in active use. So now more than ever, the world relies on Wi-Fi. Really with the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, most of our daily lives have moved online. Um, it's been quite some time since I've really interacted with, uh, with people in a, in a more uh, personal way, but we are still able to maintain contact both in our personal lives and in our work lives because of our ability to move online. We see healthcare providers turning to telemedicine to provide safer services when people may not feel comfortable going into medical facilities for non-emergency non care. And there's a number of examples of this. Uh, we see stu the student population, about 91% of the world's student population is currently affected by school closures and they are now moving to online learning. And I'm one who is personally actually um, been affected by a number of these with small school age children where they're doing their schoolwork online, they're doing dental appointments online via telemedicine, they're doing their well checks online. So this, this is not just a, a use case or something that we aspire to do. This is what Wi-Fi is actually delivering today in this current crisis. And in fact, we're seeing in some areas where, where um, bodies like the EU are actually recommending connecting to devices to Wi-Fi more readily to relieve mobile network stress. So with all of these new areas where people are moving online to deal with the current pandemic, we're seeing incredible increases in Wi-Fi traffic particularly a surge in upload traffic. So we've seen up to an 80% surge in Wi-Fi upload traffic. And this really reaffirms the need for Wi-Fi 6 and increasingly Wi-Fi 6E to address that increasing demand. Wi-Fi really stands apart from any other technology in how it can offer undeniable utility and value and this is utility and value that is going to transcend this current period we're in. In the short term, Wi-Fi really is an indispensable sound investment. Again, it is how people today are accessing the internet and getting along with their daily work and personal lives. But in the long term, the work that we do will ensure that Wi-Fi emerges even better and more valuable. Wi-Fi has this long history of providing generation after generation of backwards interoperability. People can make investments in Wi-Fi and know that it's going to have long lasting impacts. And our work enables continued growth, growth and great user experiences. There is really no other way to characterize the recent FCC decision other than truly historic. The FCC's decision paves the way for global availability of six gigahertz spectrum. We're already seeing other regulators like uh, Brazilian regulators talking about opening up six gigahertz. And Wi-Fi Alliance is doing, along with our members, is doing an incredible amount of work in promoting this in the EU and other geographies worldwide. So if you're not aware, within the United States, we've opened up 1200 megahertz of spectrum. This is, is unheard of in terms of uh, opening up unlicensed spectrum. And this isn't where we're likely to stop. Right now, very low power devices are under consideration. Uh, these are devices that can operate at very low power outdoors. So think of things like augmented reality headsets or uh, eyeglasses 
tied to your smartphone as you're moving around out about your daily life. Early estimates are showing that six gigahertz will add more than 150 billion US dollars to the US economy alone by 2025. And of course the impacts are expected to be much greater once you start looking globally. As I said, Wi-Fi Alliance and our members are working continually to gain worldwide access to six gigahertz and meet this incredible global demand for data. So how are we preparing for access in six gigahertz? Um, so the first thing, if, if, uh, if you're not aware, is six gigahertz devices are known as Wi-Fi 6E devices. Uh, so here we, as an industry, we've actually come up with a specific term to designate these devices that have this important new capability to operate in six gigahertz. Um, I know we, you know we simplified the brand portfolio with going with Wi-Fi 5 and 6, but 6 gigahertz capability really is monumental, and it's important that the end user knows devices that offer this capability. We're already expecting to see the first access points becoming available in late 2020, so in the fourth quarter of this year. And by the end of 2021, we expect more than 300 million devices in the market. There are some technologies that uh, wish they had 300 million devices shipping in, you know, at all in, in a given year. And we will have 300 million in, in six gigahertz alone. So this really speaks to how far, how much the industry is leaning forward on making the most of this opportunity that is being presented to us. Wi-Fi 6, uh, sorry, Wi-Fi certified 6 is going to be an important element in ensuring a good experience in the 6 gigahertz band. Like all other Wi-Fi devices, Wi-Fi certified uh, is, is a mark that ensures that devices will, will, will work well together, that they meet industry expectations in terms of security. And Wi-Fi certified 6 will have a new option called Wi-Fi 6E that indicates those devices can operate in the band. In an effort to make sure that the industry can capitalize on this opportunity rapidly, Wi-Fi Alliance is expected to launch our certification program for six gigahertz in early 2021. Wi-Fi 6E delivers a number of key elements to making long-term enterprise at home scenarios work. And we use that term because really increasingly in this pandemic, enterprises are functioning from our homes. We're getting more spectrum with wider contiguous channels. Um, so going up to where actually more of the default channel width is going to be an 80 megahertz channel. And then the opportunity for up to seven 160 megahertz channels to deliver higher data rates. In six gigahertz, we are moving the full complement of features from Wi-Fi 6 into this new frequency band. So all of the great capabilities you get in Wi-Fi 6 like OFD, OFDMA, which offers higher efficiency, particularly when dealing with a diverse set of device categories, everything from sensors to smartphones, tablets, et cetera, but also very, very low latency. So with Wi-Fi 6, in particular in Wi-Fi 6E, you're getting a much more deterministic network experience. We also have multi-user MIMO, which provides increased capacity and concurrent operation. So where high performance is essential to move as much data as possible, you would likely be using multi-user MIMO. In addition, we have target wake time, which brings elements of power saving, allowing devices to sleep longer in between when they transmit. But the other aspect of this that people don't focus on nearly as much is how target wake time adds network determinism. So now you have something approaching scheduled access with Wi-Fi. And you, you can expect to see this used very broadly going forward. And of course, because we're moving to the six gigahertz band, you can expect to see far less interference. And in fact, with Wi-Fi certified devices, only Wi-Fi six devices will be able to operate in the six gigahertz band. So that's a certification requirement. You're not going to see certified Wi-Fi four or Wi-Fi five devices operating in this new band ensuring that we have only the most capable, efficient devices making use of six gigahertz. In addition, with, in, uh, in, with 6E and in six gigahertz, we are raising network performance. 
So it's not just a matter of moving Wi-Fi 6 capabilities into the 6 gigahertz band. There's also a number of requirements that apply specifically to the 6 gigahertz band. The first one is we are only moving the highest level of security into the band. Every device operating in 6 gigahertz uh, will, on those 6 gigahertz channels, will be utilizing Wi-Fi certified WPA3. In addition, spectrum management is incredibly important. Things like intelligent steering of devices, fast transitioning from one access point to another. And this is encompassed in the Wi-Fi Alliance program called Wi-Fi Agile Multiband. And all Wi-Fi 6E devices are required to support Agile Multiband so that they provide a good experience of moving from frequency band to frequency band or AP to AP. So Wi-Fi Certified 6 with Wi-Fi 6E is going to bring a number of high quality experiences to the new normal. In fact, I expect you're going to hear about a number of these from the speakers that are following me today. It's going to enable the enterprise at home with high quality video conferencing, Wi-Fi calling with no dropouts, fast file transfers for multiple users simultaneously in the home. Um, particularly, I have a colleague who has uh, two, two adults working from home and two children going to college full-time from home, all demanding, putting, placing demands on that Wi-Fi network. And six gigahertz is going to make that easier to achieve. Of course, you can expect to see AR VR as an emerging use case in the six gigahertz band, bringing immersive online learning, gaming, virtual training, or something like building walkthroughs if maybe you're shopping for a home, uh, but you're not able to travel easily. And then finally, six gigahertz is going to be absolutely critical for operating in dense environments, providing elements of spectrum management, more determinism, a more deterministic network experience, even in large multifamily complexes. Think of multi-story high-rise uh, condominium complexes. Six gigahertz will be absolutely essential to a great experience in those environments. So thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what the other speakers have, have to bring. And Adeline, I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you, Kevin. Great presentation. Uh, I know you touched a little bit on, on some of the uh, use cases, but I was curious about, you know, kind of the uh, the early ways users will experience Wi-Fi six in the home. Sure. So there's probably two. There's two areas. There's going to be the early emerging use cases, which we'll probably follow on a little bit later. But then there's going to be some of the immediate benefits just using the use cases we have today. Um, I use that example of of enterprise in the home. Um, having, net, having capacity for all of this traffic is moving over Wi-Fi networks is going to be essential. You're going to see 6 gigahertz used for things like in, in multi-AP environments, you know, mesh Wi-Fi being used for the backhaul links. So, for example, you might have 5 gigahertz serving Wi-Fi 6 as well as legacy Wi-Fi devices for the access to the network. But then 6 gigahertz channels being used to connect each of those network nodes or AP nodes together. Um, so that's a way you're going to see it immediately. Um, you're going to see it in, again, dense environments. Uh, think about sports arenas, uh, other venues, transportation hubs. Uh, six gigahertz providing much needed capacity in those environments. And then the final area is, again, more of those emerging use cases. Uh, things like AR, VR that now become truly possible um, from headsets to small form factor devices like a smartphone because of those very wide channel widths that are now possible with six gigahertz. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, let's move on Thank as you. we have an uh, excellent presentation. Let's move on next to Nicola Fortino, Director of Connectivity at uh, Liberty Global International. Good morning, afternoon, everybody. Do you guys hear me okay? Uh, we hear you, yes. Perfect. There you go, you can see your screen. Perfect. So, um, my name is Nicola Fortino. So I'm working at Liberty Global and uh, I'm part of the product division. My team is running what we call the connectivity platform, which effectively enables connectivity for over 9 million residential customers across uh, our seven markets. 
Today we'll be talking about the impact of COVID-19 on people's life. Uh, but before we start, uh, I've got a question for you. Do you guys remember uh, where you were before borders were closed, before COVID? Personally, personally, uh, in the early days of March, I was actually enjoying some of the best snow in the world uh, in Canada. And I was in a lodge 150 kilometers away from any human made construction. And one thing that we didn't have over there was uh, internet. So when I got out of that place, I was three flights, one ocean away from home and very close not to make it back home without any understanding of what had just happened in the world. And I must say it was quite a shock. When I finally made it back to the Netherlands, and some of you may recognize the uh, infamous uh, Schiphol Airport, uh, which is one of the largest European airports uh, with you know 71 million customers uh, going through every year. Uh, this is basically what I saw. And I guess the rest is history. You have all seen these photos. Within three weeks, one third of the world went into a complete lockdown uh, to prevent the spread of the virus and ensure the safeguard of the various healthcare, healthcare system. Businesses and schools were closed, entire family went home, and it was the beginning of what many of us have considered as one of the strangest times ever experienced. So at Liberty, we took on to better understand what was happening uh, with people and of course with our customers and the impact on their life. So at the beginning, uh, and I mean beginning in the er early days of March, uh, the research that we did, uh, we found out that the sentiment was a bit, you know, bemused and bivalent. Uh, will it come here? Will it get to us? And uh, yeah, there were a lot of questions. But then, you know, fast forward a couple of weeks, uh, basically people realized that they were about to be hit very seriously. So what did we find out? All the research we've done highlighted that there were almost two sides of the lockdown. So let me give you a, a few words on the dark side. People were hit hard uh, and there was a massive sense of contradiction. On the one hand, so we one third of the word in lockdown, people were in really dark places. They were confused, they were stressed, they were anxious, they were, you know, potentially about to lose their job, but they had already lost their job uh, and they just didn't know what would come next. On the other hand, uh, people uh, were finding that it was, you know, almost like a positive a time for reflection, more time with the family uh, and time to realize that maybe less is more. Uh, however, it caused, generally speaking, a huge amount of turmoil in people. Uh, but now the yin to the yang. Of course, there is a light side to every dark side. Um, family reconnected. People will spend more time um, with, their love, with their loved ones, like never before. And that was really something that people, you know, cherished as part of that uh, story. Uh, people reconnected with themselves. There was more and more um, uh, activities around meditation, uh, in order to basically reconnect and, and try to find a bit of an inner peace since it was very difficult to get out of home. And eventually people reconnected also with the, the world around them, with the planet, uh, and uh, probably uh, the eco-conscious has grown as part of that because Mother Nature was effectively back at the forefront of the agenda. Overall, uh, one of the customers uh, that uh, we talked to came up with the, 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 the term of togetherness. And that was something that was very important for people, togetherness coming together. Um, how did it affect our way of living overall? Well, I suppose you will all relate uh, to the picture above. Chaotic daily schedules where school assignments conflict with your team meetings and kids barge into uh, to the Zoom call when you're with your boss. Um, we basically went from an occasional work from home situation to a structural leave at home concept, something that we have never done before. So 
We also ask our customer the role of our services during this time, the goods, the bad, and what they would like us to do less anymore. So let's take a, a second to read that particular quote, which you can see on the uh, left uh, corner. My life is online now. Without reliable high-speed broadband, I would not be able to do my job. My child would have no schooling. He would not be able to order groceries and we would not have entertainment to watch. Broadband is the backbone of this new life. I think it's one of the best summary that one could make about the situation that we have experienced and how key and strategic it has been for internet service provider, that being fixed or, or mobile. Um, when asked about ranking our product, unsurprisingly, connectivity scored one of the highest across the connectivity and entertainment uh, products that we offer. Uh, and at the very low, you can see the, the landline form, which is basically not used much. So as an industry, connectivity providers, again, fixed and mobile, have become the backbone of this new life, which is great news for us. So how do we capitalize on that? So before going through the, the numbers, uh, I think it's key here that we, we give a bit of a tribute to uh, the network because overall, and our smart Wi-Fi, because overall the networks have held very well. And what are we talking about? So when I say networks, I'm talking about the broad spectrum, core network down to the CP in the home and to the in-home Wi-Fi, which is key to uh, what our customers are doing. So let's look at the number. Time of usage, explosion. Give or take, we went from a two hour peak time to a 13 hour of uninterrupted connectivity a day, seven days a week. Data explosion. Um, our statistics are showing that the downstream has increased by 30%. Upstream went six plus 60%, way, way more uh, due to, uh, well, uh, video conferencing as we are doing. So all the work and school at home has triggered a massive surge in the upstream. And of course, the device explosion. Combination of uh, office or school devices being brought at home, but also uh, devices that were purchased by uh, the family in order to ensure that the entire family could concurrently connect. And all that, of course, has been over Wi-Fi, which has been amazing. So let's look at it from a use case perspective. So as I mentioned already, uh, we have seen a massive surge for work and home usage with regards to video referencing. From a Liberty Global perspective, we're talking about a five-fold increase. But uh, also all the entertainment side has really, really been surging significantly. We've seen a massive boost in gaming. Uh, you probably have seen that most of the gaming uh, subscriptions, so platforms like Stadia and so on and so forth, I've seen a massive spike uh, and we have seen indeed a much more uh, a larger community of gamers coming on the network. Social media exploded and from a streaming perspective, as much as Netflix and YouTube, I've also seen a surge, as you probably all know, um, Netflix and a uh, platform like Netflix and YouTube uh, reduce their uh, their bit rate and allow us to effectively contain the growth that the, the surge in, in usage of the streaming services has caused. Um, and why is it important? Well, let's not forget that why connectivity is so key. Connectivity is effectively the enabler for some of the platforms that you can see on that. And this platform uh, typically thrive and delight customers. And we need to ensure that this will be maintained. The perception of our connectivity products, and that is true for both fixed and mobile services, is effectively predicated on the quality of experience that customers have on these streaming services. So it is key as an industry that we enable quality of experience and it is ours to guarantee that uh, we will do so to ensure our own future growth. That's why it is also key for the industry to focus on what matters to end customers, the quality, and not so much the industry problem, the things that you can see on the right hand side of the screen, uh, which are industry talk, but not really of a concern for our end users. And when we ask customer, um, question, what really matters 
um, the latest research that we have done was very clear. Reliability of the connectivity service is absolute king, much higher uh, comparatively than our um, industry talk about absolute peace, speed, the move to one gig, the move to uh, 10 gig, the move to a different and better Wi-Fi standard. All these are enabler, but at the end of the day, what we need to focus on is how do we ensure strong reliability to make sure that the rope, which in this case is connectivity, uh, will hold and will be able to deliver a better experience to our end user. And our, from a liberty global perspective, our relentless efforts uh, during this tough time have basically paid off. Overall, we have noticed an increase of our customer satisfaction pretty much across all the markets. And in some cases, we have even seen double digit increase uh, during that period. Moreover, uh, our upcoming roadmap is also going to bring to all our markets very significant improvement further than what we have already in the field with regards to our Hinom connectivity portfolio to make sure that we keep up with this rapidly evolving landscape uh, that COVID has brought upon us. Finally, we ask our customer um, to comment on the future work. What is the perception of the world within a year time, both from a residential perspective, but also towards corporate business? And what we have seen is similar to uh, the, uh, the yin and yang that I mentioned before, that their answers were a bit of both of a light and a dark side. However, uh, one thing is unanimous is the fact that uh, all customers have stated clearly that we'll never go, go we will not go back to normal. Uh, and a recent research done by Dinata has also highlighted that 75% of people uh, assume that their lives will change forever. So, bottom line, we are not going back to normal. This sudden, pervasive, and prodding shifting episode has redefined the rules of how people live. Already from a business perspective, uh, companies like Twitter have started a new trend, which is basically work from home for life. Uh, a recent Bain uh, study is highlighting that customers will be very mindful of the actions that are being taken by the different companies regard to you know, health protocol, pricing, and also reliability. So we need to take the following conclusion. With this crisis will come opportunities, and it is in our power to leverage on these new use cases that are going to help people on this new journey. So as an industry, why don't we help connecting the next billion people and things? Thank you. Thank you, Miri Nicola. Great presentation, great statistics, great data you shared. I, I, uh, I know uh, there are some audio issues. Uh, the audience is mentioning that you know, uh, some of the speakers' uh, audio is fading out. So we're trying to resolve that. Uh, so just for the speakers to be aware, there have been some audio issues. And we're aware of it. So, uh, Nicola, one question. You mentioned during your presentation that reliability is key to ensure quality of experience. How do you address this? Well, I think we need to start again uh, from a cons consumer perspective. So. The best support for customer is basically the avoidance of the need to have support at all. So first of all, you typically need to correlate uh, your key customer satisfaction KPI. So different companies are using different standards. At Liberty, we use NPS, there are others. With the few service levers that, you actually, that are actually moving the needle. So what is affecting your NPS? And you need to have a very, very good understanding of that. If you don't, you never know what to fix. Second, uh, we have now got to the, to the stage where we have very significant insights on what's happening across all the products and services. So it is key that you gather and to an insight to do real-time monitoring per service. And that require, you, require the monitoring to happen per service, which is very different than the standard approach where we were just looking at the bit rates coming and that was it. And third, uh, you need to leverage on the data to identify potential root causes that are affecting end user experience and from that uh, generate insights that are going to be distributed to your business user, your support function, etc. Cetera, et cetera, but also to the end user. 
Why? Uh, because research that we've done have also highlighted that customers understand that problem occur from time to time. Of course they do. However, they do not accept to be left alone in the dark. So empowering customer uh, with self-serve support that will basically help them to go back to uh, what they expect from a reliability perspective um, is something that uh, we are looking at at the moment. Thank you very much, Nicola. Great presentation. Uh, let's get moving as we're running a little bit late here. Uh, our next speaker is Tyler Gregg uh, from Minim, who's going to address uh, you know, the edge security at the home. Tyler, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, uh, we can. Excellent. Thank you, Adelaine. And I've, I've enjoyed listening to the speakers thus far. I think there's certainly some continuity and a lot of common thread between what we're, what we're all going to talk about today. So uh, pleasure to be here partaking in this. My name is Tyler Craig. I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Channel Sales at Minim. I spent the last decade working to, to develop mutually beneficial partnerships and technology. Prior to Minim, I helped lead our solution partner strategy at, at Dyne, an internet infrastructure company, which was subsequently uh, acquired by Oracle. Today at, at Minim, I help businesses and, and service providers to enable and better secure connected homes with, with Minim's Wi-Fi management and IoT security platform. And you know, today I'm going to talk about the, the home edge security for remote businesses in this new era that we all find ourselves. A bit of backstory on the on the company first before we dig into it. You know, really why we exist. Um, we were inspired by the the Mirai DDoS attack in 2016, which was an attack that took down about half of the internet for uh, nearly half a day and involved about 700,000 uh, unsecure, unmanaged IoT devices that were compromised in a very broad, very unsophisticated uh, attack. And our founder realized that with both home devices and broadband speeds growing at exponential levels, it was gonna be very easy to do again. So to reach homes, initially we began working with internet service providers uh, and built a platform to primarily help them save on operational expenses and also to increase their revenues. Um, and as you see there at the bottom, if you haven't already read our report with Meravitas for more detail, we have one from this past November we'd enjoy you to check out. So today we're going to talk about uh, the trends of the remote workforce as we see them and the threats that those you know, trends bring to business continuity. Uh, businesses will expect to have somewhere to turn for these connectivity solutions. And we believe that MEMS bring your own network solution is, a, is an extremely sound strategy to, to address those needs. So the landscape as, as we see it shows that now is certainly the time. In March of this year alone, uh, over 16 million new remote workers were created and it's expected uh, that this trend is going to translate into nearly a third of the global workforce uh, working remotely, uh, at least in some capacity, part-time or full-time by the end of next year. Uh, and it's not just the, the pandemic, we saw these trends pre-COVID. Um, and outside of COVID, there are certainly drivers you know, such as the cost of a worker in a building, which is pegged at nearly $20,000 a year. So businesses were already looking at the cost of on-site employees. Um, additionally, surveys say it's what we all want. 99% of us anyway, there's 1% there's of people that would, uh, according to surveys, still prefer to, to work in a home, but with 99% of workers surveying said they'd like to continue working remotely, at least part-time, it's, it's pretty compelling evidence that, that this will be the trend moving forward. Uh, but we need tools to be able to do so. So let's talk about the notion of, of bring your own network. It, it starts over 10 years ago as we look at the, the evolution from bring your own device. The rise of, of wearable technology, as an example, led to 70% of enterprises quickly developing uh, bring your own device policies within just a couple of years of that new trend. Um, layered on top of that, the app explosion around 2013 led to enterprise having to further assess that and the data with, with containerization. And furthering down the line, you know, businesses begin to begin to really take responsibility for uh, and manage this, this process and the policies around next generation firewalls in order to, to really identify devices and threats on the networks. And in the last you know, couple of years, obviously smart home adoption has skyrocketed. Uh, and with that, um, you know, the increase in home IoT security threats. And so here we are today uh, with a need to bring your own network. COVID, again, has obviously led to 
a rapid expansion of the remote workforce. At home already, uh, the average person has 12 connected devices and enterprises will need to take on the management of, of this new home edge um, in order to protect their, their corporate data and their continuity. As you know, we heard Kevin mention earlier, the, the enterprise is certainly now working from home. And as businesses invest in remote working connectivity, where, where will they turn? One place is traditional enterprise security, but that falls short. There were you know, purpose built for something completely different. Uh, and with 38% of subscribers on Minim's platform alone experiencing uh, some sort of malware on their home network in any given month, uh, the quantity of devices I've already mentioned and the fact that devices lack inherent security and, and basic updating capabilities in most cases, the solutions simply fall short with, with respect to protecting against the examples you see here from uh, vulnerability exploits, uh, router compromises, phishing, ransomware, zero day attacks, uh, DDoS attacks that I mentioned as being the genesis of the company in the first place. Um, clearly, the attack vectors are are plentiful. An employer provided devices such as you know, the laptop that you see in the center and iPhones. Uh, these have have access to critical corporate data and corporate systems, and they're quite simply sitting in the middle of very uh, unsecure, very dirty networks. And traditional corporate VPNs only you know protect portions of, of PC traffic. And it's also very expensive. So on top of that threatscape, you know, we add in the chaos of, of competition for bandwidth and signal. And this has been referenced by, by the gentleman before me already. And you know, the, the burden for home IT support has exploded quickly. And you know, just thinking about this, at any given home, we have, you know, which is this new corporate network, it's where the enterprise is. You have one or two professionals video conferencing. We have our, our children remote schooling with the same technology. I think Kevin mentioned earlier, 90, 91% of, of the world's school age children have been affected by this. You have them using the same technology. And if your kids are like mine, they've been uh, you know, utilizing these same bandwidth heavy tools for dance lessons, for karate lessons, for, for virtual recesses, things of that nature. And uh, you know, we haven't even began to contemplate uh, the other highly consumptive applications like gaming and software downloads, photo uploads, uh, 4K TV. So this duress is causing real harm to, to productivity and security. And what we're hearing from our customers and partners is that service providers are, are on the front lines taking the brunt of this. We have a, you know, a couple of figures, one by uh, NordVPN revealed that global use of its VPN technologies increased by 165% uh, since the middle of March of this year. Uh, we know in late March from Verizon that they reported a 9% week-over-week increase of, of VPN traffic on their network uh, with a 52% increase in VPN use over a typical day. So this channel contention for, for resources has made managing the utilization key. And you know, business IT staff are handling support for performance of, of work applications, and they're, they're doing so with absolutely no network visibility in most cases to help. Um, and because of that, you know, they're instructing their employees to call their provider, which has led to you know, a 40% increase in call volumes is what we're hearing from, from our customers. Um, and this, while they're all trying to rapidly scale uh, and upgrade their networks that, that certainly weren't designed uh, for this recent influx. Um, in some cases, we're hearing as much as 10x scale they've been needing to achieve, trying to achieve over the past couple of months. You know, and there are other remote tools, access tools, like a, you know, a log me in, for example, but uh, they provide no visibility into the rest of the network and have minimal or or no management tools. And really, um, you know, the providers have already become, you know, somewhat begrudgingly perhaps, the responsible party uh, for Wi-Fi, even though they don't run the home network. So we feel there's a real opportunity for that service provider to become the operator of that environment to make their customers successful and and secure. In their lives, you know. Otherwise, um, they risk getting out, of, cut out of the process entirely, and we're all left with more tools and and more managed access points from other providers. And the service provider uh, really can become the responsible party to operate these environments, much as they've become the responsible party for Wi-Fi in general. So that's where we come in. Meet Minim. 
We're an AI-driven managed Wi-Fi and IoT security platform to make insights uh, available to care reps at service providers, to their subscribers and employers in order to make, uh, to enable work-life connectivity. Uh, we've talked about you know, the insecure and very uh, unhygienic networks surrounding the employer-provided devices. The notion of, of securing the integrity of that entire environment from threats such as uh, malware, botnets, lateral attacks, uh, listening attacks, inappropriate content. That's what Minim provides. And, and by leveraging a Minim enabled device to manage the network, we can secure against these, these incoming internet threats uh, while aggregating and streaming the telemetry to our cloud uh, in order to deliver back in a couple of different views. And, and something that we pride ourselves on is our ability to be adaptable and flexible. So we're able to, to layer in with other solutions as well. So I mentioned a couple of different views that our technology is, is delivered to. Uh, the first is, is Edge Extend, basically a, a web GUI that provides a centralized management to you know, empower businesses to support and secure their remote employees' networks with an extremely high level of visibility. You know, visibility to things such as uh, device inventory on their networks, the po potential vulnerabilities of the devices on those networks, uh, particular privacy settings, uh, network utilization at different levels of granularity. And it, you know, because of the flexibility of the tool, uh, the audience of this can be as, as diverse as the care team of the ISP, uh, their business customers, and their subscribers as well. Second view is a, is a mobile app for you know, the, the local network management and self-healing capabilities that we provide. This empowers employees to, to view, manage, and secure their own networks. Um, this solves a couple of very important things. It, it reduces the burden on the IT teams of businesses. Uh, it also reduces the support demands of the service providers themselves that I mentioned you know, earlier. They've seen call volumes increase by 40%. Um, so a couple of different views you see here that's, that's available inside the network to the employee basic management, uh, its own security component to view the threat scans, uh, to scan the devices on the network to see what vulnerabilities or network intrusions there may be. Uh, very granular levels of, of parental controls uh, the ability to control access, white label, uh, uh, white list and gray list, black list, certain URLs. And then of course, diagnostics to ensure the overall performance of the environment. You know, kind of the way that we think about it is that you know, our connection to the internet has, has a huge impact on how we operate as a global society. And you know, as referenced earlier, service providers are, are certainly uniquely positioned to capitalize on their position and be able to help move the support from the call centers and IT teams in, into the home itself. And when looking at what we've established as the six criteria for our solution, which is really you know, the ability to have auto-assisted home Wi-Fi and a simple deployment with integrated home policies, uh, with the notion of a, of a real next-gen IoT firewall, uh, with centralized management and a solution that's just the right size, uh, when you mesh that criteria against other players um, in the space such as a Cisco or a Juniper or an Aruba or a Fortinet, you find that Minim provides um, the right size solution, uh, a comprehensive solution more affordably than any of these others that you see here. And with the average user requiring an investment of over $1,000 per year in many of these solutions, uh, the financial opportunity for the service provider to get more deeply involved uh, is massive. And, and speaking of financial upside, we're, we're very excited today to, to announce a bit of foreshadowing. Um, we've reached an agreement with Talaris, who is a, a leading technology services master agent. And as you can see from their, their VP of cybersecurity, they realize that the demand for next generation remote work needs solid solutions. And they've chosen to work with us knowing that we have a, a visionary and unique approach to, to solving the work from home security and management problems. And, there will be more via a press release in the near future, but we're we're very excited to uh, be able to announce this and the availability of a minimum solution via their stable of, of thousands of managed service providers. So again, more to come, but something that uh, that we're extremely excited about is they recognize the market opportunity for this. So this is where minimum is headed. We're home edge management as a as a service, and we we hope that there are many others who will take the ride with us and with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their time. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, great presentation. And certainly security is a big issue uh, and increasingly so. Question for you, how do you envision the purchase behavior of residential security services 
now that there are implications in enterprise security? Yeah, you know, I think we've we've seen a couple of different models emerge for that. I think firstly, uh, you have you know sort of an, an enterprise purchase like a VPN or an, or an antivirus solution with kind of a network co-management capability to it. Um, I think you look at something like that, it necessitates, you know, kind of a, a discount by volume and a, and a central management capability for the business. I think that's, that's a primary um, you know, model that we've seen emerge so far. Uh, I think secondly, you, you think about it as a, almost an enterprise subsidy for the employee. So think of like a cell phone or like an internet subsidy. So um, an enterprise subsidy like that, where there's less or, or no central management and more of a, a flat fee program. So I think I I describe it as, as those are the two models that we're seeing emerge. Excellent. Thank you again, Tyler. Uh, and so Thank our you. next next speaker before at the top of the hour before our break is Alan Coleman uh, from Sweeper, and Alan's going to present a very different perspective from everything we heard. Uh, uh, more of a business approach to solving and enabling quality of experience. So Alan, uh, the uh, so is yours. Thank you, Adeline. Um, I'll share my screen now. Hopefully you can see that, can you? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks everybody uh, for being here this afternoon. Um, pleasure to speak with you a little bit about Sweeper and our perspectives on some of the topics that have been covered by previous speakers. Um, it's interesting that as we think, consider um, advancements in uh, new protocols and we've spoken and Nicholas spoke earlier about um, about uh, the importance of reliability of networks uh, and, in, and indeed a previous speaker also spoke about uh, the shifting trend of um, of us all working from home and, and the implications uh, on consumption patterns all of this leads to um, a challenge around uh, care. How do we care for customers um, as the homes become increasingly more, more complicated? And this was driven home to me um, uh, as I founded Sweeper uh, by uh, trying to tackle my son's um, uh, inconsistent gaming experience with uh, FIFA. So he would uh, often complain to me about the quality of the Wi-Fi that we had in our home and um, uh, when I went to try to examine the uh, root cause of his issues, it, it was clear to me that it was quite a, it wasn't a trivial answer because we had something like seven or eight different systems cooperating in order to give him good game playing experience. So uh, we had uh, the EA servers, we had Xbox Live servers, we had the Xbox, we had the extender, the television set, the router, and the WAN, all of which, um, informally depended upon each other. So um, many of those different services and products um, were sourced through different retail channels with different contracts. And that, and, and that informality worked up to the point when something went wrong. And then that informality, the only person who was formally responsible for solving my son's gaming experience was me. And uh, that seemed to me to be a, um, an unforeseen burden that I as a homeowner did not anticipate having to bear. Um, but also it, it posed a very interesting question about um, how with increasing complexity and, and change uh, of devices and protocols and services, how with relation to the different um, tasks being carried out in our homes, like increasingly working from home and schooling from home, um, how do we help the customer? How do we help the customer navigate all of this increasing complexity in the home? Today, the majority of self of, of care technical support issues end up in call centers, um, which is um, creates huge friction and challenges for the customer because it can consume anything up to 90 minutes of someone's time to try to get a resolution if it gets resolved on the first call. And also it drives material cost to the bottom line of the, um, of the service provider. So you have two entities, the service provider and the customer, neither of which are particularly enjoying the support moment, but it's inescapable. 
Because even as we progress and develop new technologies and bring new protocols to bear, we will never remove the customer's need for assistance and, uh, or, their or their perception that they need assistance. So it's not always that there is something wrong. Oftentimes it might be an educational challenge or an instructional challenge. So that's the current challenge that the industry faces when we talk about technical support. But technical support and support and care generally offers a much more interesting opportunity beyond just fight figuring out ways to reduce the operational overhead. A lot of carriers are working under various guises at what's being described as a home operating system, where they're considering their role in the future of the connected home. They are um, uh, looking at opportunities to evolve beyond just a connectivity relationship with the homeowner. And they are building up layers of horizontal function that they can provide to both the homeowner and potentially to other products and service companies who want to participate in the connected home. So um, we see care as a vital part of that evolving ecosystem. And in the future, a lot of CSPs will provide um, not just uh, uh, connectivity and care to their own home, own, their own customers and on, on for their own products and services, but there'll also be an opportunity to build relationships with OTT service providers and connectable product providers to, to in the same way Apple provides security and platforms on the iOS platform, um, CSPs have the opportunity to, to create horizontal offerings that they can in turn offer back to other uh, organizations who are looking for ways to improve the experience of their products and services in the home. In this model, we need to mask the customer from the complexity that's required to deliver this sort of technical concierge relationship. And we talk about finding ways to move care closer to the moment of need. So traditionally, uh, one of the biggest contributing factors to customers' frustration is the fact that in order to get help, you have to go looking for the right number to call or the right uh, chat client to open up, and then you have to go to authentication, and then you have to explain the problem. And all of that creates latency and friction between the problem occurring and the problem solving commencing. And Sweeper is focusing on how do we bring the moment, the care closer to the moment of need to remove that latency and to remove that friction. Um, and if we are successful in doing that and lowering the, the unit economic cost of how we help customers in their homes, then the opportunity is for support to move beyond critical outage and to start to help customers with, um, with less critical questions, but more compelling uh, in terms of how they're consuming services in the home. So instructing customers on how they use products or how they can achieve jobs that they need to be done. For example, if you wanted to buy a pay-per-view movie but weren't sure how to do it, you might not be motivated today to wait in a, on a call center line to try to find out how exactly that should, transaction should take place. But if that care was closer to you and you could speak to an Alexa or a Google Assistant to get that help, um, that question might be vocalized, which would allow the provider to intercede and help um, and give both parties a, a richer experience. So we, de derive, we develop um, interactions that are contextually relevant. And let me talk, talk to you what I mean by that. So a journey within Sweeper is that the customer can express the problem they're having in any way they so choose. So that you can say, why well, is my Netflix slow? I can't play my game. Or you can um, use uh, as often happens, some uh, varying degrees of uh, exasperated expletives as you try to describe the issue you have at hand. Sweeper allows you to, to, to deliver that request for help over multiple different channels. We're agnostic on the channel. We think voice assistants have a, uh, a very important and emerging role to play in this area, and I think they'll become way more prevalent than call centers, but we equally engage and deploy across uh, mobile SDK built into support apps, chatbots, voice assistants, off IVR systems, basically wherever the customer's request for help 
um, is preferred or placed, Sweeper can 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 grab that intent, grab the the expression of of help that's required. So we use our natural language understanding uh, technology to identify what the root cause is. We then analyze the diagnostic context. So we don't exclusively rely on the customer's articulation of the problem because oftentimes. Uh, particularly non-technical customers struggle to describe in enough detail what's their, what problem they're having. So we take what they've said, we take what we can see across the network analysis and diagnostics, across any de available device diagnostics, and also across any service, OTT service availability knowledge that we also have. And we combine all of that to make a prediction as to what exactly is happening for that customer at that moment in the home. And we do things like intent mapping and we use machine learning to ensure that journey gets better and better. And we have a rules engine to help the, help the operator design different pathways for different problem types. And what ultimately this leads to is um, one of four different outcomes. We either detect the customer expresses an, an issue and we detect it and know how to intervene and we we uh, take a technical intervention. So we speak to a Wi-Fi management platform, we speak to an ACS, and we make an adjustment to try to fix the problem. Oftentimes, the intervention is more subtle or needs more customer involvement. So we, we call that guided care, where the customer needs to take some steps themselves. Think, for example, of a self-install, or potentially um, uh, it can be educational. So explaining to the customer uh, why Wi-Fi might be struggling to reach the loft or why um, what, the, what radio interference is uh, on a network. So explaining that all the various aspects of the challenge that they're facing. It may infer that nothing is actually wrong with their home at that time, but it will help them understand the context. Thirdly, uh, a solution might be a commercial solution where we need to position or suggest an extending an extender product to extend range or an upgrade in the in the data plan that the customer is on. And finally, if any and all of that fails and uh, and we, for example, can't understand the customer or we can't help the customer with this particular problem, what happens is we take what the customer has said and we take what we saw diagnostically and, and we take any steps we tried to take to solve the problem and we raise that as a ticket automatically on a queue for a human agent to, to, rate, to, to work the problem. And they'll have all of the context they need to understand the frustration the customer is having and hopefully intercede to help the customer with the problem and then they can reach back out to the customer. And in that way, Sweeper... Uh, offers the promise that we can end inbound calls to care because in that scenario we've captured the issue verbally and uh, we've uh, even though we haven't been able to fix it through the self-care journey we've been able to um, we've been able to uh, capture the issue and, and, and intercede the most so the diagnostic context is a very important aspect of what we do but a similarly important and arguably more important aspect is the fact that we do not treat everybody the same. We recognize that not everybody is, is similarly technical and therefore we uh, design our solutions to reflect the relative level of techno technical competency of the customer. So um, in the way in which we have developed this philosophy working with our uh, senior vice president of um, customer experience who is has a PhD in this area she developed this idea of confident optimistic and avoidant personas effectively different ways to reflect the relative level of technical confidence a customer has and depending on which of those three persona you are we develop different journeys so if you're a confident person the explanation to solve a problem will be punchy and pithy and maybe a list of things that you need to achieve uh, using uh, technical language. If you're on the avoidant end of the scale, then the journey for you will be uh, using different vocabulary, using much more psychological encouragement and, um, and will uh, be a, a much more um, illustrative, uh, rich experience. Uh, and that's a key part of how we solve to help the customer. Um, and 
a key philosophy behind Sweeper is that you simply can't remove the human factor from how you develop self-care. Self-care is not pushing your customers away at arm's length from the human factor. It's about making sure you develop your self-care experiences with, with to be empathic to the problems they're having. So this is just one example of a deployment that we're currently undertaking. So uh, the problem is uh, expressed uh, verbally to either voice, uh, a voice em embedded voice agent within an app uh, or through a chatbot or through a Google Assistant. Um, we then combine that with diagnostic input from uh, the Wi-Fi management solution that has been deployed. We hook into the various CRM systems that are also available. And then through that process, we're able to push that moment of intervention, that moment of triage out of the call center and into the home. Uh, so that's one of a few different deployments that's currently ongoing both in Europe and the US. So finally, just to kind of sum up what sweeper is about so the traditional support model for home is economically unsustainable but more importantly it's an unsustainably poor customer experience and hence and that's a widely acknowledged desire of the industry to to provide more enablement to customers and it's been it's been acutely felt during this period of COVID-19 as the restrictions on uh, co-location has meant that the call center environment becomes a much more difficult place uh, to, to keep people. Um, so customers' reliance on technology in their home is only going up, as we've seen again, uh, an acceleration during the last three or four months. Um, the relationship with the customer needs to improve. So this uh, investment in self-care cannot be at the expense of engagement uh, and uh, inclusion of the end customer. Um, and so we're developing solutions that we believe um, uh, vastly improve the customer experience uh, and increase the perception of brand value that the CSP is giving their customers because you're able to get uh, to assist the customer more quickly, more often, in a way that's more in tune with their needs. Um, and then finally, the opportunity, as I mentioned at the beginning, for, for, for operators to take uh, this investment in self-care and extend the offering out to third-party uh, OTT service providers and, uh, and connectable product companies um, uh, sets up a, a really exciting uh, way to, to kind of develop the connected home and develop top line revenues associated with it. And with that, I will pause. Thank you, Alan. Uh, a lot of material, exciting stuff. I know we're running late, so I'm going to ask you very quick if you can answer very quickly this question. Now you mentioned different technical skill set. Can you expand uh, on what effect that has on the success of self care experiences quickly? Certainly, yeah, very quickly. What I, I, so one of the, the, as you might imagine, avoidant customers or non-technical customers are the dominant persona type that end up in call centers. And specifically with, um, with designing self-care for the non-technical customer, um, we're able and have seen that we're able to attract avoidant customers to try self-care more often and to persist with it for longer and hence be more successful, which means for that kind of intractable cohort of customers who depend on call center interaction, that we're showing a lot of success in shifting them into a self-care channel in a way that they feel is appropriate and enjoyable. Thank you. And again, uh, uh, you know, uh, for those that have questions, you know, we'll do proper follow-up. So this ends the first part of our program and has a lot of material. We all need to take a break here and breathe and you know and rest our brains and take a glass of water. Uh, so I'm gonna time it for two minutes break, please. This presentation is dive into a bit more detail into the use cases. And specifically at the Comscope, we have been looking uh, uh, to leverage the Wi-Fi 6E technology more quickly and by seeing, okay, is there some immediacy, uh, some immediate uh, use cases that we, uh, that we could deploy uh, rather than waiting for the traditional uh, evolution cycle and the upgrade cycle of devices in the home, which takes uh, two, three years, devices get refreshed and then new technology gets uh, distributed in the homes. 
it's also a bit linked to what uh, uh, Nicola was saying about uh, broadband is the uh, the backbone of uh, of this new life in in uh, in the COVID times. So we strongly believe that the broadband experience is more and more defined by the Wi-Fi experience. So if we can uh, leverage Wi-Fi 6E quickly to deliver a better Wi-Fi experience, I'm sure that we also will be able to deliver a better uh, broadband experience. Now, at the same time, uh, Nicola also uh, said that people don't, uh, consumers don't really care about technology. Eh? They often don't know about uh, AC, AX, uh, 6 e uh, They don't know which band they're on and so on. So let's maybe start first by trying to get a, a consumer mindset eh? and, and look at Wi-Fi 6 e as, as a consumer could potentially look at that. Yeah. So if we try to describe uh, Wi-Fi as cars, then you could say that uh, uh, B, G, and N was really about the, the first time that we could drive a car and the first time that we could get a wireless connection and we were pretty excited about that. The second evolution was with uh, AC, which was really about uh, the people's car, right? Get, getting a car to everybody, right? making sure that you have uh, range and coverage. And that's the two key words of AC, getting Wi-Fi uh, uh, everywhere available to, uh, to everybody. Then the next evolution was uh, Wi-Fi 6. Huh? So Wi-Fi 6 was really like a bit of the introduction of the electrical car, huh? a, a whole new level of, uh, of performance, a whole new level of, of technology huh? that could really bring uh, the, uh, the experience to, to a next level. And then finally, if we look at uh, what Wi-Fi 6 e is bringing now in terms of cars, you could say that it is almost like a Bugatti, Vi Bugatti Viron, I'm sorry, uh, to, uh, to everybody. Uh, so it brings like 33 to 66 gigabits of, uh, of Wi-Fi capacity with low latency and uh, uh, in a deterministic way to, uh, uh, to, the, to the people, right? Now we all know that just having a fast car doesn't get you uh, anywhere faster. So let's maybe extend that analogy a bit and, and have also a look at, at the roads that these cars have, have to drive on. Yeah. So if you look at uh, 2.4 gigahertz, basically there we had uh, like three non-overlapping channels of uh, 20 megahertz wide. Huh? So three rather small lanes of, uh, uh, of, uh, of traffic and where our cars could, could drive on. Then with five uh, gigahertz, the introduction of five gigahertz, we really got uh, uh, quite a relief huh? as, as the 2.4 uh, gigahertz lanes got, uh, got saturated. Huh? We, uh, we got this five gigahertz spectrum that really brought us a lot of uh, new traffic lanes huh? that, that we could use. And we could even, uh, rather than have small lanes, have bigger lanes huh? up to three times 160 uh, megahertz uh, lanes. Yeah? Of course, as a side note, this depends a bit on the country that you're in. Huh? So in some countries you have, you might have uh, less spectrum available or less lanes available than in others. But in general, that's, that's more or less the, 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 the picture. Now, a bit of disadvantage of that is that on these uh, lanes, you still uh, also have the old cars. Huh? So also the old cars are still driving over these lanes and, and could create some, some uh, traffic jams. And at the same time, uh, sometimes these lanes are also used by, uh, by other uh, people, uh, for example, here uh, by, by planes. Uh, so sometimes planes have to land on, on, uh, on these roads. This could be a, uh, an, uh, a weather radar or, or something like that, uh, which basically means that you have to back off uh, and uh, with DFS, select another lane and give priority to, to that other traffic. Right? So that, that uh, all in all, 5 gigahertz gave us uh, uh, quite a good relief for quite some time. And, and it still delivers, uh, uh, especially in combination with uh, Wi-Fi 6, a very good uh, Wi-Fi experience. But we start to see some uh, saturation in, in complex environments. Uh, in dense environments, we start to see that, that uh, Wi-Fi uh, is, is reaching its limits. And there, Wi-Fi 6E really opens up a whole new uh, world of, of possibilities. So basically, what we are doing is, is we are, again, doubling the, uh, the number of lanes. So now you can have up to seven uh, lanes of 160 megahertz uh, wide. And what is also nice is that only the, the new cars can, can drive on it. So you don't get uh, uh, behind an, uh, a slow car anymore. So what is also nice is that it's uh, uh, scheduled uh, low latency. Uh, so you will have much less uh, collisions, uh, which in a, especially in a crowded environment used to be sometimes challenging in, uh, in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Uh, so now with uh, a full uh, scheduled environment with only new cars, uh, you, you get really a lot of predictability and a, a, a guarantee for, uh, for low latency. 
Yeah? And then with a uh, low power indoor and AFC, uh, also in the future, eh, extra uh, capabilities uh, will be added there. So, and then finally, it doesn't stop there. Eh? So the uh, the standards are, are already looking at uh, 320 megahertz uh, uh, channels eh, with um, uh, ultra high uh, capacity. Eh? So creating even a faster lane eh, for even new trucks eh, to to transport the data even even faster. So what we want to avoid is that we end up with this, huh? so that we have on the one hand a road, but the road goes nowhere, huh? that there is, a, a, for example, an access point, but there is no client to connect to or, or the other way around. Huh? So uh, at Comscope, we are uh, really looking at some uh, uh, immediacy, huh? again, to, uh, to see, okay, huh? what are there any use cases that we um, can deploy already now huh? in, in tandem combination of a client and, uh, and an access point where we can Im immediately get benefits of, uh, of Wi-Fi 6E. So we're doing that in the uh, service provider space uh, where we uh, uh, are defining use cases for uh, enterprise applications, for uh, outdoor venue and campus. We're doing that in, in retail. Huh? So in the US, we also have a, a retail offering. Huh? So we're doing that also in, in the retail market. And then we're doing that also in the, uh, in the consumer market, huh? looking for this Wi-Fi solutions, end-to-end huh? uh, -end type of, of solutions rather than, than just a device. So to uh, uh, make it a bit more um, uh, showable uh, is basically what we are looking for is an immediate effect where we have on the one hand an, uh, an access point and the other hand a client, uh, for example, a smart media device or a setup box uh, that is immediately leveraging this new uh, 6E capability. Yeah. So if we, sorry about that. Uh, so if we dive into a bit more into the uh, the possible applications and, uh, that are enabled by, by uh, Wi-Fi 6E, we can then see uh, which bookend applications and uh, which end-to-end uh, uh, -end applications or solutions could be applicable in, in the short term. So the first thing that uh, Wi-Fi 6E is, uh, is bringing us is really uh, low latency. Huh? So what are uh, typically uh, low latency applications? Huh? So that could be uh, low latency gaming. Huh? The importance of this uh, has been stressed already by, by the previous uh, speakers. Huh? Also with the move like Stadia, huh? a more and more of a cloud-based uh, uh, gaming, this is becoming more and more important. Also, as uh, service providers are becoming more and more uh, converged operators, uh, uh, doing fixed and mobile together and, and creating one integrated experience, also there are opportunities um, to have some uh, femto cells, for example, being connected over Wi-Fi uh, for uh, 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 clock-dependent uh, synchronization. And then the last thing for low latency is, of course, the, uh, the, the virtual reality, augmented reality headsets, huh, where you really want to have a very good uh, uh, user interaction and, and latency is, is, uh, is key for that. The next thing that uh, um, uh, Wi-Fi 6E brings us is uh, relief for potential 5 gigahertz con congestion. And there we see a really great opportunity in uh, MDU type of environments, huh? so in, in apartment type of, uh, of environments where typically you see now a lot of interference uh, between the, the different uh, uh, units. Yeah? So with uh, Wi-Fi 6E, you really have the capacity to give everybody in his own apartment an, uh, a 160 megahertz channel huh? just, just for, that, uh, for that apartment. Huh? So here you have an example uh, of how you could uh, distribute the, uh, the seven available channels across the, uh, uh, the, the different uh, uh, apartments. So we believe that's really an, uh, uh, a great opportunity um, uh, for 6E to, uh, to uh, show its benefits. The other um, use case could be around uh, pseudo wire applications. So uh, basically what we see today uh, quite often is that you have a, a two box type of solution uh, where in, uh, in a home you have on the one hand the ONT that terminates the, uh, uh, the broadband connection. And then you have a three feet uh, ethernet cable that connects to your wireless access point. Uh, that is then uh, providing the, uh, the Wi-Fi connectivity. Yeah. Sometimes this is, is just one box, huh? but typically the two are deployed uh, closely together somewhere in the corner of the house huh? where uh, the cable enters, enters the home. Uh, 
Yeah. So one uh, great application for a pseudo wire type of uh, connectivity is to have the ONT somewhere in the corner of the house and then move the access point somewhere more centrally in the home uh, to be able to provide uh, good coverage through the home you know, with then wireless uh, dedicated uh, uh, link back to the uh, back to the ONT. Yeah. And what we see now is that today this this uh, this is a wired link. Yeah? So in today we see that this is a uh, often a, a one gigabit uh, Ethernet type of link. Yeah? But uh, what we see now already in our new, uh, latest gateways, we see our uh, to match the uh, the broadband speeds. And of course, the uh, the Wi-Fi uh, sh should follow uh, and should match that that capability. Yeah? So there again, uh, Wi-Fi 6E is 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 a great opportunity to to match that finally that uh, 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet goal uh, with uh, a wireless uh, capability. Then the next uh, application area is of, of course around uh, high bandwidth applications. So there, I think it was already mentioned before, an, uh, a typical application is to use uh, Wi-Fi 6E as a, uh, a Wi-Fi mesh backbone. So to have multiple access points through the house and have a dedicated Wi-Fi 6E uh, uh, radio uh, to, uh, to provide the, uh, uh, the a wireless backbone through the, through the home. Other opportunities could be uh, high-speed wireless uh, NAS uh, to have uh, very fast wireless uh, backups. Could be uh, wireless projectors. Could be again uh, wireless HDMI type of uh, of uh, uh, experience uh, with uh, VR AR uh, headsets. And then also on on the set-up box front. Uh, so uh, today we have um, uh, quite successful. Um, deployments of uh, wireless set-top boxes over, over Wi-Fi, even with 4K. But as we move in more dense environments, and if we move to, uh, to 4K, to 8K, sorry, uh, Wi-Fi 6E might uh, make that experience even, even better and, and more reliable. And then finally, we also have the uh, uh, the, uh, the potential low power Wi-Fi applications uh, with uh, the the goodies of uh, of um, uh, Wi-Fi six, like uh, target wait time, battery saving, and so on, uh, where you could have use cases around low power uh, Wi-Fi cameras, uh, low power Wi-Fi IoT devices, uh, and overall uh, better Wi-Fi uh, um, battery life. So this is a bit of a, of a different view at, at the use cases mentioned before, and more from a technology point of view. So uh, as you probably know, in Wi-Fi 6E, different uh, power levels have, have been defined. So at the, at the moment, the main focus is on the, uh, on the low power, which really uh, enables the use cases like uh, the residential multi-access points, as we, as we mentioned, the MDU um, um, type of deployments and, and, and so on. But there are uh, clearly uh, other use cases that are uh, very nice, huh? like the, the very low power uh, portable uh, device use cases, huh? the, uh, the standard power if we get there. Huh? So moving from uh, uh, the 250 milliwatts with low power to uh, one watt uh, power, huh? if we combine that with, uh, with AFC, huh? that, that could really enable, again, an, uh, a whole new set of, uh, of, uh, of applications. And then finally, there is also more the the outdoor type of, uh, of uh, use cases uh, with fixed point-to-point uh, um, -point and point-to-multipoint type of connections enabled by, uh, by even uh, uh, stronger signals. So in all in all, and what we think might be a, a, a potential service provider set of bookend applications is, is listed in, in, in this slide. Huh? So we believe that um, uh, uh, people will be looking for an, a, a tri-band uh, gateway. Huh? So that is providing as well 2.4, 5 gigahertz and uh, 6 gigahertz uh, uh, Wi-Fi support with the 6 gigahertz being used, uh, for example, for uh, Wish MiFi, uh, Wi-Fi mesh, sorry, to uh, connect uh, tri-band extenders to provide a dedicated uh, or a high reliable um, uh, Wi-Fi link to, uh, to uh, an 8K, 4K setup box, to provide a wireless link to a, a Femto cell, to provide low latency gaming, and potentially to provide a high-speed uh, wireless NAS. So we believe that this uh, bookend type of applications could really create uh, immediacy around uh, uh, Wi-Fi 6E and create really value in, in the short term for, uh, for end users. 
So to finish, I would like to end with a bit of uh, uh, what we would call uh, in Comscope the Wi-Fi 6C North Star. Huh? So how could be the ideal home of the future look like with Wi-Fi 6C? So there we see uh, a 10 gigabits uh, one connection coming to the home, and then an uh, 802.11be 320 megahertz uh, wireless back uh, uh, backhaul um, um, uh, channel. Huh? Covering, covering the home to then uh, wireless uh, micro nodes potentially in, in every room, huh? um, supporting from 25 milliwatts, huh? so the low power use cases up to the 500 uh, milliwatts huh? um, um, uh, normal. Sorry, Stephen, uh, uh, can, sorry, can you wrap, wrap up please? Because we're running out of time, thank you. Sure, this is the, the last slide anyway, Adelaine. Uh, okay, so the you. last thing is to say, yeah, as Comscope, we are really excited about this uh, Wi-Fi 6C opportunity and uh, Looking forward to uh, to help getting that to market. Great presentation. I apologize. I have to rush you here. That you're really no problem. Uh, running you're right. out of time. So I'll I'll send you the follow up questions uh, by email. So let's go uh, next or next speaker, Telefonica, Carlos Gandaria, uh, to discuss uh, you know uh, Telefonica's Wi-Fi strategy as well as. Uh, it's our own experience with uh, the surge uh, uh, from uh, COVID-19 uh, stay-at-home uh, uh, broadband traffic. Uh, Carlos, there you go. We can see your your, uh, your slide. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, many of the topics that I, I'm going to talk uh, has been mentioned in, in previous speakers, but anyway, uh, let's focus on, on the presentation. And at this point, I'm going to to show you what are the Wi-Fi uh, perspectives at home in Telefonica. And uh, at the latest of the presentation, I want to share with you some important numbers at, uh, with the lockdown in Spain. Okay, so let's start. Here it is. Um, which is, uh, let's start with Telefonica. You know that Telefonica is known by the large uh, footprint of, uh, of uh, fiber deployment. We have the last fiber deployment in Europe, in Latin America as well. You know that we started to, to deploy fiber many years ago. We started with only uh, 20 megabits per second symmetric. Then we increased to 50, 100, uh, 300. Now we are deploying uh, 600 megabits per second uh, symmetric fiber. But uh, that must be supported because the customers has not uh, connected directly to the fiber. The, the customers connect to the to the Wi-Fi, so uh, that must be supported by a good, very good Wi-Fi connectivity. So our global chief technology officer says that uh, we deploy fiber, but we sell Wi-Fi. So Wi-Fi is uh, is very, very critical, very important for Telefonica. Right now, at this moment, uh, you know that many, uh, many all the customers use Wi-Fi. It's the key wireless technology for connectivity at home. Um, the speakers have mentioned the importance of Wi-Fi of wi at home. Uh, very important to have a reliable connectivity at home because the customers claim uh, for full Wi-Fi coverage. The, the customer claim for good uh, reliable uh, connectivity uh, of Wi-Fi. Uh, regard, regard, regardless of the high number of uh, devices connected at home, regardless of the external interference or the of the Wi-Fi that they are using to the 4 or 5G, they don't know what they are using, but they want to have a reliable Wi-Fi connectivity. That is uh, that is the most, the most important point for the for a customer. And for service provider, we must try to, to provide that, uh, that reliable connectivity. So uh, it is very important that at the same time that the network access is increasing, we must evolve our, uh, our routers and our uh, access point in order to achieve what we are offering to the customers. We must uh, be in the state of the, of the art of the Wi-Fi connectivity because the customers, if the, a customer hired uh, 600 megabits per second by by fiber by network connectivity, he wants to 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 check that that uh, speed is also in in their home and not only the speed because the speed is not not the most important but also the high connectivity, the good quality connectivity at home. So. In Telefonica, some years ago, we defined what, what we call the smart Wi-Fi ecosystem. And the smart Wi-Fi ecosystem is dedicated to enhance the customer experience and to have the engagement of the customer with the connectivity at home. And it has mainly four different parts. 
the first part is the uh, firmware and software, the firmware in the CPEs, very important to support uh, what we want to do in the CPEs, uh, the software in uh, in an application in, that the customers can download in, in their smartphones. For sure, very important as well to have the network connectivity and a good hardware. The hardware is the is a critical point here because the hardware must support uh, the Wi-Fi evolution. That is uh, also that we are, we are working on. And uh, another very important part is the cloud layer. For what what is the cloud layer here? The cloud layer is the is the part that is receiving all, all the information, all the technical information about the connectivity of customers uh, at customers' home. In the cloud layer, we have all the data uh, related to the customer connectivity, and that can be used for the operational and technical team in order to uh, anticipate or in order to fix uh, customer complaints or try to check uh, why why there is a, a call uh, to the operational center, why a customer can have any issue at home related to the Wi-Fi. So this is something very important and critical because uh, we can anticipate and we can understand what is happening at customer's home. Without the without this data uh, obtained for the customer at home, uh, we, can, we are blind and we will not be able to do anything. But uh, from some time on, we are able to check what is happening in, in customers' home, and that helps our operational team to understand what happens. Okay, and then a fourth part of this ecosystem is the third-party solution. There are, uh, we are open to third-party solutions. We are open to collaborate with, uh, with companies that can help us to, uh, to improve the, the quality experience of the customer, to, to provide new services to the customers. Uh, so that is very, very important as well. So the smart Wi-Fi has uh, two uh, tangible points. One is the hardware, the other is the software. In the hardware part, uh, that is uh, our area. In the hardware part, in Telefonica, we define and we uh, and we develop our own products. We, de we develop the ONT Plus router the, with with uh, Wi-Fi 5 some years ago. Uh, we have more than almost 6 million devices ONT plus router uh, deployed uh, all over the countries in Telefonica. So that is a, a very very large footprint. Uh, we have also a range extenders because we want to offer the full coverage at home. And that is very, very important for customers. And another important point is that in the hardware, we are able to build what we, uh, what we want to evolve. It means that we also want to uh, provide the bank steering, roaming, uh, seamless connectivity to the customer. Okay, that is uh, from the hardware perspective, perspective point of view. Uh, in the software, we have a, a continuous evolution of the smart, smart Wi-Fi application. The smart Wi-Fi application allows the customer to check how is the network, the wireless LAN connectivity at home. Uh, it can manage the access point. It can create a guest network. It, it can do some kind of, they can do some kind of diagnosis, basic diagnosis, if the Wi-Fi is interference or if the Wi-Fi is, uh, if, if the device is very far away from the, from the, from the access point, uh, it shows an alarm. So we are try, trying to improve because the customer uh, must not uh, take care of the Wi-Fi connectivity alone, but uh, he can do so, uh, some, uh, some things to understand what is happening at home. So we try to help them in this way. Uh, in the evolution of this, uh, of this smart Wi-Fi uh, ecosystem, uh, for sure, we are evolving our routers, our routers and standards continuously. We want to have a smart hardware uh, products with uh, with latest uh, state of the art of the on, the on the connectivity on Wi-Fi. We have uh, we are evolving right right now our uh, HEU, which is the FTTH uh, ONT router, to an, a new a new router supporting Wi-Fi six. Uh, the new software. For sure, we must evolve the new software connectivity and uh, looking at the customer, uh, putting in the application what the customer are asking to us. So we we must understand what the customer uh, needs are now in the Wi-Fi connectivity. And 
including Wi-Fi 6. Wi-Fi 6 not only for improving the connectivity, but also to support uh, new services, also to support the home IoT uh, connectivity at home. Uh, that is a critical point right now uh, to support Wi-Fi 6. The evolution for the Wi-Fi 6E is also there, so uh, we are going to evolve to Wi-Fi 6E. Right now, we are uh, deploying our first extenders uh, with Wi-Fi 6 uh, in Spain. This extender is a 8x8 plus 4x4 Wi-Fi extender. Can be plugged directly to our FTTH router and it is auto configurable. So the auto configuration is working. The customer only need to plug to the uh, to the fiber router and the uh, Wi-Fi 6 extender access point will configure itself. So it is a, a new product. We are having good uh, good feedback from the customers. It is on deployment right now, starting deployment right now. We are evolving our FTTH router as well to support Wi-Fi 6 uh, with 8x8 plus 4x4. And this is uh, also supporting the new XGS phone technology, uh, which will provide uh, up to 10 gigas uh, to the customer. So that is, uh, for thinking on the future evolution, it is a, a totally new product, and we want to launch this year, during this year. Uh, and we are uh, extending the user, uh, the smart Wi-Fi application, we are extending this application to allow the user to make the auto installation, because sometimes we think that the, the customer, if they are aware of the technology, uh, we think that they can manage to do the auto installation at home of the Wi-Fi extender. So this is uh, something that we are working on as well. And for the future evolution at home, the overview of uh, or view of the future evolution at home, one one critical point is to to support the Wi-Fi 6 because the Wi-Fi 6 is progressively penetrating in the residential market, and there is a great tradition of, of Wi-Fi 6 devices. Uh, there are new Wi-Fi 6 devices right now, and we see that the, there are, there will be increasing a lot during next year. Uh, to include the Wi-Fi 6E. As other colleagues have mentioned, the Wi-Fi 6E e will, uh, will be a new uh, Wi-Fi road. Uh, this will bring low latency, uh, high speed, new services, uh, possible Wi-Fi backhole, possible Wi-Fi connectivity uh, without any cable. So Wi-Fi 6E is, is coming and it will be there very soon. And, and together with the Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi 6E, we see a, a big opportunity to work on new services related to the IoT. The IoT connectivity at home right now, we want we want to, to enforce this IoT connectivity using Wi-Fi, no other technologies. Other technologies probably needs uh, external hub, external connectivity. Uh, the Wi-Fi is on the router. Why not to use uh, only Wi-Fi to the IoT connectivity? We think uh, uh, that IoT could be a, a, a good uh, traction for the Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 6 e and uh, latest point is that uh, Wi-Fi could be used for new services, uh, using Wi-Fi to trigger new services, uh, because uh, we know some uh, startups, we're working with some startups that are using Wi-Fi, we can uh, provide location, we can provide motion detection, we can, uh, we can trigger uh, service related to security at home, uh, to video surveillance. So this is something that we must work on for the future as well. Then some, some numbers that we want to share with you about the, the COVID-19 in, in Spain. This is something uh, just uh, very new, uh, taken from Spain network uh, during, during March, when we were uh, looked down in Spain. So these graphics show the increase of the Wi-Fi use uh, comparing a normal live, living weeks with the coronavirus time where we were we were we were uh, locked down. We were at home. So the in the graphics, the the blue shows the first two week of uh, of lockdown. The orange shows the second two weeks of the following two weeks of lockdown, where the lockdown here in Spain was was very very restrictive. Only essential essential activities were were allowed. So as you can see in 2004, the, there was an increase in TX and RX traffic uh, during the lockdown period almost in all the in all the times this this data 
was achieved in Spain in three to two million of access points, so it is an important number. And uh, in total for the traffic was rising between 20 and 50 percent. So it is an increase because we were at home, and, and there is an increase. And the numbers are quite important. But look what happens in 5G. In 5G, the the amount of traffic, the increase of the traffic was uh, double at least in TX and more than double in RX. So the traffic in in Apple, uh, is 100, almost 150 percent increase. Uh, during the morning and afternoon times, so that is a, a huge increase. In, increase in the only thing that is it is only in the Wi-Fi 5G in all access points. So to double the traffic in the access points is a is a, a is a very very large increase. And this happens only in the first uh, two weeks, uh, the first two weeks of the uh, lockdown, compared with the previous uh, two weeks where we were working. Uh, and our lives were normal lives. Okay, so in this is the summary of what we obtained with these statistics. In Wi-Fi uh, to the four, the increase is more or less between 20-40 percent. In Wi-Fi uh, AC using 5G, the increase is double, uh, the double of the traffic. One important point is as well that the number of average uh, the, uh, connected devices at home increase between 40 and 50 percent that is uh, uh, because we were at home that is uh, an important increase and and the numbers of march only of march the month of march where we were locked down in spain the increase of ip traffic on telephonic network in spain was 35 percent this number is five percent higher than all the previous three year the uh, 2019 all only in one month uh, the increase of the traffic were, were larger than uh, all the previous year. So, and why this increase? Uh, for sure, all people have talked about uh, the new uh, connectivity at home. We were, we are social. We need to communicate. We were at home. We were not. We have not the possibility of going out. We uh, we use video conference. We use the gaming. The video conference uh, increase uh, into much more than all the year the last year. That is. Uh, uh, a real reality in Spain as well. So uh, we use the online gaming, we use the purchasing online, uh, new services, uh, healthcare as well, uh, remotely healthcare. So all that is reflected in the in the data that we have seen only during two weeks in during the lockdown in Spain. So uh, with this data, you can see that the Wi-Fi statistics uh, during lockdown in Spain shows that the Wi-Fi is a uh, is the key technology right now at home is uh, is the main uh, connectivity technology at home and this is critical for us as well so this is all from my side thank you for inviting me to join this meeting and that's all thank, thank you carlos thank you great great information about your strategy and data on COVID 19. so we'll, we'll leave questions offline because we need uh, we're approaching the, the second hour. I would like to uh, move on to our next presenter, Mustafa Ergen uh, from Startup Ambient. Uh, Mustafa? Hello. Uh, let me share. There you go, we can see your screen, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, we are very happy to be part of this webinar and uh, appreciate this opportunity to present Ambient. And we are developing a concept to organize World Wi-Fi with an AI-based spectrum broker. And I'm going to present here how we intend to achieve this vision. Everyone stressed today that you know, after COVID-19, how Wi-Fi is indispensable. How Wi-Fi is crucial. Everybody today lives with Wi-Fi, and not only in daily lives, but also our corporates, schools, hospitals, and factories depends on Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is oxygen today. However, as all, we all know, Wi-Fi is vulnerable since it uses unlicensed spectrum. You know, have you seen this while you are connecting to Wi-Fi? We know this because deployment is crowded. Anyone can deploy their own Wi-Fi network. There are mixed mega models. Every year, 4 billion new devices enter the picture, 
and cumulatively speaking, currently 13 billion Wi-Fi devices are in use. So how many Wi-Fi connected devices we had three years ago and how many we will have in the near future? The stress on spectrum will severely impact the performance. Although today it works, Wi-Fi performs wastefully, especially in a densely populated urbanized geographies in multi-story buildings. This not only hurts me as an individual user, but also the entire business community and overall economy. One second delay can cause $1 billion loss for an e-commerce company. How does it hurt? You know, when we see this, we suffer from the interference problem, commonly known as neighbor interference. Paying for fiber or expensive modems will not solve this problem for us. The only way to solve this is by collaboratively orchestrating the spectrum. And that is what we do. We started with a groundwork developed in UC Berkeley and started to develop our product with the seed funding. And our so solution is recognized by the key industry platforms for the past one year. Lately, we are accepted to prestigious European Innovation Council's Accelerator Program. And our team involves known people from wireless industry and academia. And we have already have uh, three customers and we, uh, a few more pilots are in queue as well. Now let me give a little technical detail about how Wi-Fi works. There is mixed deployment and Wi-Fi is designed in a distributed decision making and backward compatibility is a must, which means that any new Wi-Fi generation device has to work with the older generation ones. Uh, regardless of how much you pay for the fiber internet or high-end router, if your neighbor is sharing the same channel with you, total capacity is bounded by the lowest modem capacity. For instance, Think, think of this as a brand new Ferrari or Bugatti for Stefan. In the heterogeneous and heavy traffic, it has to wait for the slow moving car in the intersection. So what we do, we get rid of the intersections. How do we do it? We ensure smart channel allocation. This needs to be done collaboratively. This is because either your neighbor is served by a different service provider or using a different router. So our first customer provided that in their internal task in 100 trials, seven of them showed significant improvement with our technology. In an improvement, they could reach 156% speed increase. Uh, as we know, Wi-Fi spectrum is a scarce commodity. Wi-Fi industry so far focused on selling more chipsets and more boxes, and this made Wi-Fi successful. Uh, it dropped the prices. Number of devices grew exponentially, but available spectrum didn't. In 1999, we started with 70 megahertz in 2.4 gigahertz. 10 years later, we added 500 megahertz in 5 gigahertz. 10 years later, we could only double it to 1.2 gigahertz with the recent 6 gigahertz allocation. It looks like we are increasing the channels. However, apps are requiring more bandwidth too. So available non-overlapping channels are still limited from 3 to 6, 6 to 7 in every 10 years. Further, it gets more complicated since it, we will have a small network in every home because we will have one box in every room. So radio frequency management is a must, and that's what they are doing. Ultimately, we want to introduce application aware channel allocation. For example, you are watching a Netflix movie, or you are using a collaborative ap application. We should assign an interference-free channel to that user and distribute the rest of the neighbors to other channels. This is a rational way to maintain Wi-Fi quality in the future. To do this, you have to be device-centric, and agnostic to any service provider, any make and model. And this is basically pushing the Ferrari to the highway. You know, how we do it, uh, it's a big, this is our big picture. We have a SDK that can get into any mobile application or any device in use. It's GDPR compliant and a cloud platform that performs optimization and learning. It learns, generates insights and sets you in the best parameters. We achieve this with zero integration, since there is no new hardware, even no new firmware required. That is why our interoperability time is minimum, and we can be live quickly in a customer. This gives us a very good price performance ratio and speed to market. Our spectrum optimization algorithm is dynamic and very agile. You know why this mechanism needs to be agile in the beginning? First, there are routers we can control, and there are routers we cannot. And uh, there are routers we can control, but not available at a given time. So we have to take care of all the possibilities to make sure the system reaches to optimum performance. We use information from devices and reconstruct a graph in the cloud. We then cluster them dynamically 
and implement a heuristic algorithm. Further, we speed up with the deep learning. We can, we can reach 18 times uh, speed increase. Uh, this will ultimately work as a Wi-Fi spectrum engine, and anyone can consult this engine to get the best parameters. Further, we provide a console for everybody to do this first troubleshoot. This console processes the aggregated information from, from your devices. It monitors many parameters, including signal strength, speed test, link speed, and we process and per customer, we provide the value. So a customer could be a home, a hotel, a shopping mall, ISP, or an OTT. So what do we do? First, we check whether this is a Wi-Fi problem or not. We make sure from client side that transport path is smoothly flow flowing. Any backbone problem, for instance, uh, can create huge wave of customer complaints. We collaboratively detect and report back. So this is a six-day aggregated map of one ISP customer we have. Further, we then process all subscribers' data and give personalized recommendations. We give recommendation about current session. We give recommendation about the placement of the CPE, or we can talk about the coverage or any legacy device in the network. We, customer, we provide a customer-specific dashboard, and this dashboard is provided as an API to customer CRM. Also, as a network owner, you can predict what will happen next, what, what will your, your network look like tomorrow or one week before now. So that's why we built a scalable engine to serve this purpose. I'll give some customer examples. You know, TurkNet was one of our first customers, and they would like to automate their call center process. And we provide a self-cure mechanism, and we quickly become live in TurkNet. And we also started to predict, according to Wi-Fi quality of their customers, whether that customer will likely to file a complaint or not. Millericom was uh, another customer, and they would like to know more about the Wi-Fi experience and to shorten the call durations of the call center, as well as the resolve the customer complaints uh, quickly. So we become live there quickly as well uh, by integrating our SDK into their application. Lately, we are live in Vodafone. Vodafone has more than 10, uh, 22 million mobile subscribers and 1 million fixed subscribers. Both of them are using one application. And they would like to improve the value proposition of the Vodafone app. And we are integrated to that app. And now their fixed broadband subscriber has a tool to improve and optimize their Wi-Fi. And their mobile subscriber can monitor their Wi-Fi as well. And then they can switch to Vodafone if they don't like their current uh, provider. Overall, our subscriber base reached to millions from, from 1,000 in three months and keep growing. For instance, if you, if you look at this problem from the CP perspective, it could take years to get into one operator. In the enterprise front, we have, a, uh, we have more insights and optimization. Our value proposition in mesh ecotones or enterprise Wi-Fi installed hotels or shopping malls is also uh, available and we could, because we could provide user level heat maps and perform not only channel allocation, uh, but also position verification, steering recommendation, and even power allocation recommendation to uh, Wi-Fi owners. More importantly, it's very easy to integrate. You know, we provide a document to your app developer and the system becomes live and, and you can select which functions to use and when to use them. We also address end-to-end -end experience for an ISP. A call center agent can trigger installation monitoring and troubleshooting of Wi-Fi and trigger maintenance from the same console. They save time, money, and can do it everything in one screen. Uh, we first tested the product market fit in a home market. Now we have few pilots in the enterprise market and we are getting ready for six gigahertz uh, to do a band and channel allocation and in discussion with few OTT players. We think our method can scale to be the spectrum broker, not only for Wi-Fi, but also 5G private. Managing spectrum is controlling the neck of the communication. When you orchestrate from this point, we can trigger a consolidation and cost reduction easily. And our biggest opportunity in terms of scaling is our correct positioning at day one. And uh, being mobile-centric and 
being collaborative and having a zero integration functionality can really make us uh, scale this product easily. I'd like to wrap up here and uh, looking forward to your questions. Also, when you see a Ferrari in green light, remember Ambient. Thank you, uh, thank you uh, Mustafa, for delivering this presentation at Wi-Fi 6 speeds. <laughs> uh, you know, be, before, and I appreciate uh, uh, Chris' patience here. Very, very quickly, a question. Uh, can you explain the integration process? Um, as uh, I tried to mention, we, we have a zero integration uh, functionality. We provide a piece of document to application of the owner of the customer and then they integrate our libraries into the existing application. So this could be a mobile application, Android, iOS, this could be smart TV application or Alexa, uh, you know, home, uh, Google Home type of uh, devices. So overall, what we want to do, what we want to uh, know is, you know, as, as we know, Wi-Fi quality is, you know, known unknown. You know, we know what could happen in Wi-Fi experience, but what we don't know what re what is really happening in there. So we can serve one Wi-Fi point from multiple angles, from the tablet, mobile application, TV, and uh, smart home device, so that we can really understand what's going on in the Wi-Fi uh, wi channels. So in that perspective, you know, um, we support Android and uh, iOS uh, operating systems, and we can get into any client-side application easily. That's great, thank you. Thank you again. Chris, uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, you know, I know a lot of the audience wants to know what to expect at the next uh, uh, Bowman World Farm event, so uh, stage is yours. And, and after that, we'll wrap up. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for having you. And for those of you who are still, um, still on at this time of the morning, afternoon or evening, um, it's great to, to kind of be speaking with you today. Fortunately, I should be hopefully be able to keep this quite short, really, because what my work is at the Broadband World Forum and what to expect is pretty much a summary of all the fantastic themes we've been having here. So quickly, just a, a very kind of short overview. I know many of you will be familiar with the Broadband World Forum. And in fact, several of our excellent speakers this afternoon, Mustafa, Nicola, uh, and a couple of the others, I think, as well, have actually been speakers at Broadband World Forum in the past. So in a normal year, what would Broadband World Forum be? It would be 4,300 attendees from over 90 countries, all converging as one. For this year, it will be in Amsterdam, um, taking place between the 13th and the 15th of October. This is in fact Broadband World Forum's 20th year um, and what we kind of find is these are many of the fantastic operators from all across the world as well as their content providers and enterprises who are coming along as well as about over 150 of their kind of vendors um, and technology services service, um, suppliers as well. Um, in terms of what I'm about to talk about today, it's the connected home in particular, as we've been hearing all about the kind of smart Wi-Fi going into that. How are we responding uh, and ensuring that our consumers um, and our customers are kind of well looked after and ready for what the world is going to throw, throw at them over the next few months and, and has been throwing at them over the last few months. Um, so here's just a, a quick overview. And obviously you can go and re-watch this and you'll get the slides after, so I'm not going to take up too much more of your time there. I think the main thing to notice, though, is this last bit, this Connected Home Summit. So over the last couple of years, we've had uh, the Connected Home as an integral part of our content, particularly as one of our premium tracks of the show. But when we were looking forward to 2020, um, even before um, COVID-19 became a, a major issue for the industry and, and for everyone around the world, um, we were thinking that for Broadband World Forum's 20th anniversary, we really need to take it up a level. So part of this was looking at what are the content streams uh, we should be building on and really investing in for our audience and uh, for the wider broadband industry. Uh, and it came to us that it's about the application focus. So lots of the applications which we've been talking about or, or we'll be thinking about in the smart home um, they're really enabled by Wi-Fi 6, by the kind of advanced uh, ways of optimizing and measuring the customer experience, 
and also bring them new experiences and services. Um, so I, I'd like to pose a quick question for you guys now to think about. Don't, don't worry about answering, we don't quite have time for that. But think about and perhaps reach out to me after this um, with your answers. But the first question is, how smart a home do you personally have now? Think about this. Uh, we had a speaker at last year's show who we asked him about, do you have a full fibre connection? And he told us, you know, I've been working in uh, laying foam and ground and broadband connectivity for 18 years. I only just got a full fibre connection two weeks before this conference began. So guys, so we're talking about a smart home, we're talking about a connected home. How smart is your home right now? And the next kind of thing I want you to think about is, how smart a home do you have and do you want to provide for your customers and your customers' customers next year? Because this is the kind of place that we're going to be going on to talk about there. So how are we looking at the connected home for 2020 at Broadband World Forum? We break it down into the connected home. This is where we think more about things like Wi-Fi 6. How are we kind of bringing together um, visibility into the home network? How are we managing that connectivity? How are we kind of achieving that seamless experience which customers, uh, consumers, they're all wanting and expecting more as we heard with Sweeper's presentation with Minims. They also want that safe experience as well. Um, thinking about what are the operator device strategies? How are they having to think about uh, as Stefan said with Comscope about what other devices they're putting in and they're building into what they're offering in their home package. And we're also bringing in new people into this. So we're actually bringing in device operators to talk about how are they adjusting their strategies to be able to offer an interlink with the great amounts of connectivity we're having to offer and expecting to offer around our homes. The second side is that smart home. This is looking more at the kind of what is a value proposition to customers and consumers? What is the way that consumers are actually finding and uh, engaging with these new services which we're running? And then in terms of those services, no telco can do it all. It's all gonna be about the kind of partnerships you can make with OTTs. That's been a massive trend just in the last three months. Thinking about how, how are we kind of looking at services like Netflix, Disney Plus, uh, Amazon Prime, how they've been a, a great kind of winner out of people being locked at home. Um, but also the new side of partnerships, the enterprise engagement. How do you have to actually deal and advance those services further and faster than you've ever had to do before? And what's really kind of driving this new service landscape around offering a seamless experience across a vast range of services, which you have to be able to segment more in that. Uh, in Alan's presentation, you kind of saw that idea of uh, a son, he's got his gaming, gaming thing, he's wanted to do that. Obviously you've got Alan himself having to, to work alongside. And actually the segmentation you have to do is no longer just about a particular family, a particular household, it's right down to the individual. So how are operators, how are their service partners pairing and really being able to offer that level of customization to their clients. Now, that's all for me. Hopefully that's been a quick enough wrap up and you've had plenty of time, but please do send across uh, your kind of answers to that kind of thinking about how smart is your home and how smart is the home you actually want to provide. Now, obviously a physical event like Bob and Report. Thank you, Chris. Uh, super excited about uh, your event. Looks like it's going to be a very interesting one. And I believe by then, you know, open mm. Europe will be uh, open for business again for, for, yeah. for travelers. Well, I want to thank everyone, uh, all the speakers, and of course the audience for sticking around for you know, two hours. It's been a pretty amazing event. Um, really happy uh, about the content. And uh, again, the uh, event is been recorded, and the slide deck and everything will be available in the next 24 hours. Thanks again to everyone and uh, have a good rest of your days. Thank you again. Thank you.